Hi, everybody. We're still a little bit early yet, but uh, I might as well begin. I see that there's a, a good one. Uh, we're here on EdChat Interactive. We're using the Shindig platform. And our first speaker is going to be Jeff Zuhl. I'm not authorized to introduce our second speaker, uh, but I'll let you know his name anyhow. It's Tom Murphy. Uh, and they're going to be talking about professional learning. Now, let me just go back to the beginning and uh, of my intro slides to just go a little bit about EdChat Interactive, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Shindig platform. Uh, we started EdChat Interactive, that's Steve Anderson and Tom Whitby and myself, uh, because things happening in education today, and it's really difficult to scale them to pass them from one teacher to another teacher, from one school to another school, or one district to another district. And so we felt that by having online conversations using video led by some of the people who are doing great things in education, that that would be an interesting thing to try to see if we could spread uh, best practices around, around the country and, and, and around the world. So that's why we started EdChat Interactive, and we found that the Shindig platform was uniquely able to allow us to do that. And on Thursday, we're having another EdChat Interactive, and this is going to be on game-based learning. Uh, we'll have uh, Professor Ryan Schaff talking with us, and uh, his book called Making School a Game Worth Playing. And actually, this will be a two-part session because he's going to go over some background information, and lead some, some big-picture conversations on Thursday, and then and then the following Thursday, talk to educators about what types of games they're most interested in and what they're using in class and, and how they integrate that into lessons. So that'll be next Thursday. And of course, you can always register at www.edchatinteractive.org. So I'm going to introduce the first speaker, uh, Jeff Zoll. He's assistant superintendent at Deerfor Deerfield, Illinois Public Schools. Um, as work for the uh, Southern Region Education Board, S SREB, SREB, and he's written um, the, what I counted is something like over eight books. Um, this last book, uh, Leading Professional Learning, he actually didn't have to write because I understand that Tom uh, did most of the work on that book. You know, the name of this is, is professional learning, and a lot of people talk about the term professional development. Why do you choose professional learning for both the name of today of the uh, session? Yeah, Mitch, thank you, and, and thank Can you, you thank everyone for being here today. We Jeff? really appreciate it. We're passionate about professional learning. Just thank you for the opportunity to be Yep. Again, thank you for being here. Mitch asked about an important distinction. It may seem like a small thing, but that idea between professional development and professional learning. Um, we, we intentionally use that word professional learning. Our core business, no matter what our role in schools, is learning. And not, not just student learning, of course, it's first and foremost student learning, but it's also our own learning. Our kids are going to learn more the more that we learn. And we make the point in our book that nobody really goes out and gets excited about being professionally developed. But most teachers and educators, any role you have, we are all concerned about learning. That's our business. That's why we enter. We like to learn and grow. So it's a subtle distinction, but an important one, we thought. And today, we're just going to take a little bit of time. And, and in our title, we have three words that we're going to try to focus on here, leading, um, empowering, and then the tools. So we, we thought we'd touch on three themes over the course of this next hour. And starting kind of in that order, it all goes uh, back to leadership. But Mitch, can you bring up the next slide real quick, please? Uh, just also wanted to say, offer the opportunity, perhaps during this conversation and after, to extend it via Twitter. And if you want to do that, we'll follow that and add in as well. And the uh, Twitter hashtag we're using for this is leadingpl with a hashtag sign. And Mitch, let's go to the next slide. How many of you have uh, seen this? Uh, oh, we jumped ahead on me. Have any of you seen this meme here before? You've seen a lot like this. I think this one originated out of uh, Quakertown, Pennsylvania, where Tom Murray was doing a lot of professional learning. And this sarcastic response came about as a result of Tom's uh, professional learning leadership. And then he and I got together. And I helped him grow a little bit in that area. Right, Tom? 
And uh, Mitch, on the next slide, let's get one conversation going, then I'll come back and follow up. Could we take, just to start about, we may go three or four minutes on this, folks, and just ask you, when you think of your personal experience with professional learning, what comes to mind? And I would say, by all means, talk about any kind of that, but maybe focusing a little bit on what you've experienced as sort of what you'd call traditional learning. What comes to mind when you um, think of your own personal professional learning? Let's take three to four minutes. We'll listen in a little bit, and then we'll come back. Tom, you up? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So I saw you you got to talk to a few people, you know, during this this short uh, interaction. What what were some of the things that that you heard people talking about? Uh, sure, it was a mixture, and it was good to meet people. I mean, we did some introductions, um, you know, and certainly talked quickly about a new platform, but certainly a mixture from hearing from different people on their experiences. Um, some a uh, few people just quickly mentioned that were, were very engaging, like they jumped to the uh, very positive things, and we're certainly hoping to highlight some of that today. And then some the more traditional, like the the professional development that's been done to them um, instead of the professional learning that they've been a part of. And so, uh, good conversations, good to meet a few people as well. Okay, do you want me to bring up the next slide, or do you want to call somebody up to the stage? Yep. Which slide? Okay, I'll bring myself down. And hello, everybody, from, from my end as well. Uh, all right, just very, very quickly, it's good to, to have you join us as well. Um, just very quickly, my day job, um, I work for the Alliance for Excellent Education in D.C. Uh, my team is running the Future Ready Effort for the, the nation, the U.S. Department of Education, um, and I work with, uh, alongside Congress, the Senate, the White House, the Department of Ed on educational policy issues, and uh, my job is to support the great work of our teachers and our school leaders nationwide. So with that, uh, kind of with that intro, um, one of the things that often comes up, and, and Jeff and I, when we wrote this book and, and we started to take a look, and, and just through my, my own and his own experience, we really started to look at traditional professional learning. What's fascinating, if you take a look at the research that's out there, and there's a lot of research on professional learning, really nowhere will you find and if you do find it please send it our way but we haven't been able to find any research out there that shows that the traditional model and we say traditional we're going to kind of define it here quickly that traditional model that's really typically top down often set by somebody in a district office maybe a, a director of, of professional learning and not that that's a, an inherently in, a bad position at all i don't want to um i don't want anybody to have that as a takeaway because it, it's certainly not but something that's top down comes out of district office and then you might have one or two people that are planning for four or five hundred people trying to plan what they're going to be doing on certain days of the year or just certain and workshops um, kind of drive by PD somebody comes in for one day or uh, one session and then you never see them again it's often that traditional model traditional set really that one side it's a whole piece you know it's fascinating for, for Jeff and I as we took a look in here is you know school districts around the nation have been talking about differentiating for kids they've been talking about this concept of differentiating for decades truly decades there's not an educator in the company or the country that hasn't been talking about it but then when we when we look about as school leaders how are we uh, helping our teachers grow professionally we often utilize that one size fits all approach which is completely counterintuitive to everything about learning that we know is also what it's completely different than the expectations we would set for our own staff but traditional PD is often that one size fits all it's often planned as I mentioned earlier by just a few people in an entire school district I spent four years in public school right up until uh, about a year ago um, as a teacher as a principal and as a district level um, technology director and in working through professional development there was definitely times that the entire district's PD would often be planned by just a handful of people and that's certainly more of a, a traditional model Model. Very often there's little teacher input, you know, it was very much top down and instead of bottom up. And I think part of the reason we've seen things like ed camps and those types of things, which we'll talk about, be so incredibly successful, it is because it is more bottom up and, and everybody has truly that say. That sit and get model is, is, is um, talk to teachers around the, the, the nation and ask them about their next professional learning day or professional development day. So many times you're going to get eye rolling. You're going to get, you know, that bell rings at three o'clock or we're done at three and there's a mass exodus out the door. But that sit and get model, just like we wouldn't want to do for kids all day long, is certainly something that's that we've seen often being ineffective. It doesn't mean that you don't do something, you know, we're all sitting at this point. It doesn't mean you don't do something that's... Um, it takes short periods of time. Of course, you're going to need some informational pieces, but how do we make it interactive? How do we make it relevant? How do we make it more engaging as opposed to that sit and get hours based model? 
Um, a little opportunity for that teacher feedback is certainly something in a traditional model that, that we would rarely see. You know, we would expect teachers to utilize feedback that we give them as school administrators, but quite often, where are we asking for feedback on, on their own professional learning? on what we can often do better. And also many districts look at professional learning as a set number of calendar days per year or a certain number of hours. To just share a very quick story, where I was in Pennsylvania for those 14 years, when I moved over to district office, I challenged my, my um, colleagues to say, we really need to put out a survey to all staff completely anonymously from district office. I'll, I'll work with the union president to do it, or a union state, and I, I wanted to make sure that people really knew it wasn't just uh, coming from me or this wasn't big brother looking down. And so we worked with our, our union president to put out to our staff Let's rate our professional learning. Let's rate our, whatever you want to call it, program, whatever it was at that time. And what we found after we received feedback from over 400 teachers was that we had under a 20% approval rating. And our traditional one-size-fits-all, hours-based system where they had to do a set number of calendar days and hours per year was completely ineffective. We realized that we had to completely transform what we're doing and flip it up inside its head so that people could really take ownership of it and feel like they were a vital process, part of that process. When I was an elementary principal uh, my second year, and a great teacher, she came to me in February and she said to me, she said, hey, Tom, and she handed me her sheet. She said, I'm done with my professional development for the year. I finished my hours. And I kind of laughed and congratulated her on my drive home. I remember thinking, wow, this is the system we've set up where somebody's obtained the hours that they often think, I'm done for the year. And in the supervision conversations at the end of the year, the conversations I would be having at that point was, here's what I attended, here's the hours I earned, here's what I went to. And over time, we realized that mattered almost very little, if any at all. It didn't matter where they were, it mattered really what they got out of it, how they transformed their classrooms. And so part of those stories was part of the premise of the underlying notion of how do we transform learning as a whole. So Mitch, can you go to the next slide there? So part of that is we started to talk about um, high quality professional learning in our district. And where I was there in Pennsylvania, after a two year period, what I can uh, gladly say is we had over a 95% approval rating from our teachers. And what we actually did was we got rid of all, all required hours and we moved professional learning to supervision. I'm not saying this is the only way, I'm, I'm saying this is the way that really worked for us because we allowed teachers to start to create their personal roadmaps. So personalized learning for teachers started with them. It started with their input on, here's how I want to grow professionally there. This as a professional, this is what I need to do. Here's kind of my plan here. And then as a supervisor, we would sit side by side with them. Say, you know what, you also need to grow in this area based on what we've seen in the past. Let's work together to be able to, to grow here too. So the supervisor was really an integral part of that conversation. So in the, our next conversation here as a group, and we're gonna go back into pairing up again here, is how can we start to personalize <clears throat> those, whether well, we're going to call them roadmaps or whatever for teachers, and move away from that tr traditional professional development. So in your groups, what I would ask, we'll take four minutes, is talk about how are you personalizing your own professional learning, and then if you're working with teachers, how can they do it as well? And hopefully we can pull one or two people up from the audience to share just very, very quickly thereafter. So go ahead at this point, pair up with somebody and have that conversation on how can you personalize professional learning? Let's go ahead and do that. I'll ask him to pull you up. Hey, hey Jeff, you're back can you, up. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. Okay, do you want me to bring the slides up or, or do you want me you know, to bring somebody up onto the stage? Yeah, just for a second, would you bring up Garrett? He was had an interesting point about the corporate world and he's now in the education world. He's from Canada. Garrett Zimmer, would you pull him up? Hey, Garrett, Hi. can you hear me? I can hear you, Joel. Garrett, I just wanted you to share with everybody that last kind of little bit you were sharing with me in our private conversation about your experience in the corporate world and how that translates and then and should translate to education. Certainly. Um, so I, I have a bit of a corporate and entrepreneurial background, and I recognize from some of the discussion you were having earlier that this is exactly something that has been used for years and years in the corporate sector. Um, individual learning paths, individual career paths. One thing we realized in, in my stage as a director of an organization was that you, you can't force a person to want to be in leadership. You can't force a person to enjoy a particular part of their environment. But if you allow that person to naturally gravitate 
to those areas that they're they're most passionate about, you get just exponential returns of motivation, and that transfers to team leadership. And I think for the teacher's perspective, that will really translate into improved student motivation, uh, improved opportunities for new types of learning environments. So it's been successful in the corporate world, and I'm, I'm really excited to see its path into the educational sector. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, thanks, Garrett. So, um, Mitch, do you want to bring the slides back up? I'll follow up on that just a little bit. And, um, you know, um, so Garrett says it's been working in the corporate world. He's got experience with it working there. And honestly, you guys, I see it working really well in our classrooms from, from teacher to student. And you hear so much more about them. I think Tom alluded to that, you know, personalizing learning for our kids. So why can't we do that for for adults. And I think it starts with leadership. And we simply have to model the way. So our first theme we were going to talk about comes from one word of our title, the word leading it. And, and we have to lead that. And I want to pick the brains of everybody here today. How do we lead that? I'll just share one thing. It's an obvious thing. And you all have done this too, I'm sure. But in our district, when I came on board two years ago, we're in a very high performing school district. And possibly as a result, we were fairly traditional in everything we do from instruction in the classroom to professional learning that we did from the district level. And the very first thing uh, we did when we came on board here, the superintendent and myself, we came on July 1 of 2013, uh, we really emphasized Twitter and we really tried to model the way and really walk the talk. Everything we said teachers should be doing, we really honestly sincerely tried to do that ourselves. We, uh, we got a district hashtag going, and believe it or not, that was probably the first critical step in transforming a little bit our professional learning uh, model. We're not there yet, but we're getting there, and we're a whole lot further than we were when we arrived. But it starts with leadership, and in our book, Tom and I talk about that. Uh, and that's why, obviously, the book's called Leading Professional Learning and Personalizing That. It's, you know, there is no greater determinant of student success than the classroom teacher. In our opinion, there's no uh, greater determinant variable and teacher success and the school leaders that impact them. So Mitch, will you go to the next slide? We'll maybe have one or two short more conversations. And I guess I'd like to ask you guys, I just shared one way with the district hashtag, got the process started here, but how can school leaders, whether we're principals, district office leaders, or instructional coaches, assistant principals, how can school leaders best model their own learning uh, in a way to help transform professional learning? Mitch, could we take about three or four minutes on that and have some more conversations? Hey, so uh, I hope everyone can see again. I had a conversation with two, uh, two educational leaders in a nearby district here in Chicago area, and a couple of words that I wrote down that they were saying was, you know, the importance of sharing as leaders what we are learning and how we're learning and sharing with uh, those we work with the, you know, the collaborative nature of it all. And thirdly, the word I heard them say was just the excitement and the energy. And, uh, and that, I, just, I just, I can relate to that. I, I'm, you know, I'm on the north end of my career. I've been doing this for 30 some years and uh, it took me a while to transform my own personal learning. And I hope to be a model for others in that way. And, and, and at least my own district and hope beyond. But, uh, I put four things on this next slide that I think are simple things. Well, I say it's simple. It's not. Nothing's simple at first. You know, we change what we do. Um, but blogging, social media, in-service time, and faculty meetings, I think that those are four critical areas where we as school leaders have a direct influence on those with whom we work. And we can really model the way in those four areas. Uh, first and foremost, blogging. Uh, years ago, uh, Mitch referenced a couple of my books, you know, early on, they were just emails I would send to my staff on a weekly basis. And when I finally made the move, moving beyond a weekly email to, um, to blogging, that was kind of a hard shift for me, putting myself out there and you're never sure what you have to say is worthwhile. But I think it made a big difference when the superintendent, Mike Lubefeld, and I did that here in our district, that it showed that that was a safe thing to do in a, in a promoted thing to do and, and when people put their blog out there at first you know there's nobody listening maybe or reading but all it takes is a little bit of a spark and then eventually that tipping point happens so I think when teachers blog and they get their kids blogging 
again, what's good for the kids in the classroom is also good for us. So I think when teachers get their kids blog and then more importantly, they themselves blog, that they burn and grow. And that, so we have to model that first. So I don't think it happens too often, except in the case of our true superstars where that happens in, alone in, a, in an isolated cell. So uh, the other thing I said already, social media, it's not just Twitter, but for us, Twitter has been the umbrella where all the other learning has come from and the connectivity. Um, I think faculty meetings is huge. If, if you are a principal or one who runs any kind of a district level leadership meetings, you know, so often, and I still see it everywhere I go, where we talk one thing, but then when we get those teachers in the room, we're not modeling what we ask them to do. So I know a lot of you in the country have uh, not have gone away from whole faculty group meetings every week. I know we don't do it quite as often as we used to, but I think it is important to get face-to-face -face once in a while with the entire faculty or staff or the district team that you're leading. And when you do, it's important to start those meetings off by modeling some learning you have engaged in recently and sharing that and being excited about that with those you lead. And uh, finally, the in-service time. I, you know, again, Tom spoke to this at the beginning. We, we can't just have the one size fits all. I think we have to find ways for, it's gonna be probably a balance because there are probably district guidelines and rules and policies and procedures. But we have to break that box a little bit and see how can we send different people off in different directions on in-service days and allow them to pursue, as Garrett was saying, some interests that they have in, in building up their strengths. And uh, in becoming, I think when we do that, we encourage more leadership and we can only win when we have more people in our district leading. And it's not just the one or two building leaders or the one or two district leaders. So I know that you know, I'm gonna go over to, uh, so our first theme today was really leadership. Our second theme today, is really empowering. And Tom, uh, uh, Mitch, if you can bring Tom up and the next slide up, uh, Tom will lead us through how we empower those around us. All right, well, it's good to be back. I also had some great conversations there and really just building off of what Jeff had shared. You know, I remember being a building principal and as I sat there and I talked at my faculty during a faculty meeting for 60 minutes, I remember then the next day, there was this one particular instance, I, I remember it, I sat in a teacher's room, she was a third grade teacher, and she talked at the students for the entire 60 minute math lesson. At home, I went and I went back, and I started to think, I'm about to tell her, we really can't just stand and talk at people for 60 minutes. And I had modeled the worst that I could have for her the way I ran that faculty meeting the day before. And so that is certainly, though, one opportunity for building leaders to model what you do want in the classroom. What kind of instruction are you looking for? And the same with in-service days as well. So much of the, the work that we had done previously was that top-down, one-size-fits-all. And as I shared when, we shared, when we moved our thinking, teachers became engaged. Teachers were planning. Teachers were running sessions. And on a given in-service day, we might have 140 sessions planned by 140 teachers run um, requested by 140 different teachers as the way they wanted to and it was just a great way to be able to get them engaged and get them a part of the process so part of that though as we take a look and we've looked at the professional learning research that's out there part of it really comes down to that ownership and that empowerment and he who does the the owning of the learning in a traditional model the people that own it are traditionally the people that are kind of at the top planning it they invest days sometimes weeks and hours just planning and planning and planning for those one or two days quite often and they own all of it and then when the teachers get there they tell them okay here's what you have to do in that environment only a few people own it but when we can create a system where everybody and that ownership is shared people start to realize wow this is relevant people start to realize wow i have a say in the matter and when people have a say and they realize that it's relevant they become more engaged and when they become more engaged just like kids the learning and i don't make to make i'm not um, being condescending at all saying making a kid reference but just like we would in the classroom when when teachers are engaged in their own professional learning they're going to get a lot more out of it so our next conversation for about three minutes here is how can school leaders do this how can they best empower teachers to take charge of their own learning? What does it look like? So let's take a couple minutes to share, um, pick on or grab somebody there and just share a thought on how can, how can leaders empower teachers as opposed to a traditional model? We'll come back in three minutes. All right, well, we're gonna come on back here. Um, some great conversations, we've got a few new people there as well. You know, one of the themes, and let's go to the next slide there, Mitch. 
Um, one of the themes under the ownership and empowerment aspect, and one of the things that we address in the book, is that we need to recognize teachers as learners first. You know, in a traditional model, we often treat the 30-year veteran, maybe master teacher, and that fear my first day out of college teacher, the exact same. And we need to recognize that they are all learners first. Sometimes we've seen the, the second year teacher be a complete rock star and be able to turn and, and teach that 30 years teacher something different and vice versa. But we need to stop thinking that this one size fits all approach is going to, to really make an impact because every piece of research out there again is showing that it's not. And we need to recognize that teachers are learners first. Mitch, next slide. You know, when you take a look at this graphic, one of the things we often sometimes we often do in education, you know, when we talk about differentiation with kids, I know when I, when I was teaching back in elementary school, the first few times I, I tried to differentiate, what did I do? Maybe two groups. And so here you've got the red apples and the green apples, and I called it differentiation. And, you know, that might be one step in the right direction, but we know that that's not true differentiation. That's not true personalization, which is really what we're trying to get to. Mitch, go ahead. Next slide. So as we recognize that uh, that teachers and, and all educators and we as principals, we, we certainly have strengths and we have different and certainly have different needs. And, and I'm stating the obvious there. That's not something new. That's not something um, that you, you didn't know prior. But when we take a look at that and we realize and you can see the pencils here that we are all very different. So how do we build on those strengths? Just take the that something as simple as, as technology. For some, it is very simple. For some, it is something that is a huge stumbling block or challenge. And that's just a quite example that we've seen over and over. You know, we constantly preach that need for differentiation for kids, yet we often turn around and do the exact opposite for our staff. And so I'm hoping that you guys just discussed, here's a, a few ways to be able to empower teachers to take that ownership. As I was mentioning earlier in the conversation about how the district I was in when we really transformed what we were doing, teachers started to become part of that process. Teachers started to say, and we used to um, survey them before every traditional in-service day in a calendar that we had, and we would, sur we would survey it, tr traditional in a, in a calendar mindset, I should say, but we would survey them. What is it that you need to learn? What is it that you can help lead? And every teacher had to require, they put them in there. Or you want, you know, you're professionals, so let's hear from you. And it really transformed the culture and the mindset to this is something that's systemic and ongoing um, and on a daily basis. So Mitch, go ahead, next slide. So how do we start to empower staff to design their own learning? The example that I had given earlier, we sat side by side with them and we create, we called it essentially their roadmaps where a principal and a teacher would sit side by side with, and the teacher would come with, here's my roadmap for growth this year. These are some areas that I want to grow in. These are some areas and some ways that I want to do it. You know, in a traditional model, we often say things like this or things like Twitter chats or things like camps don't count. And when we focus on things that are, whether or not it counts, teachers end up doing things because they count, not because the learning that comes out of them quite often. And so I, I can remember again, myself being a teacher in this regard, and there was times where I signed up for the same workshop multiple times just because I needed two more hours to finish up my time for the given year. And then there were things I didn't go to because they wouldn't have counted. And yet when we see the explosion of ed camps and we see the explosion over 300 Twitter chats on a weekly basis and those kinds of things, both examples of things that people aren't paid to be at, aren't paid to do, they go because they're, they're relevant. They go because they can be involved and engaged and they can have a say. So how do we start to empower staff to design their own learning? And we certainly lay out some, some ways to do that, some paths and some, some examples there in the book. Go ahead, uh, Mitch, to the, the next one, next theme. We're going to go over, jump back to Jeff, and we're going to talk about now tools to connect educators. Hey, thanks, Tom. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, before I talk about the tools, just to follow up quickly on what Tom was saying about one specific thing. You know, I know it's not new probably to the folks on here. If you're on here, you're probably familiar with EdCamps. But that is something that, uh, you know, Tom said, who's going to the ed camps on Saturday in our district? Are those our, you know, laziest teachers or more, more likely our very best teachers? And, and if it's, uh, sorry, I lost you there. If it's our best teachers, which I assume, uh, how can we honor them and recognize them and give them credit of some sort for attending those? And along with ed camps, one other thing we did um, that I think transformed our district that very first year we have so very few formal big blocks of time after the opening two days that we have before the school year starts. Our in-service days are so few and far between. But one great thing we did for a half-day in-service we had this year that Mike Lubefeld, our superintendent, and I were here, 
we organized a district-wide informal ed camp. And we were so very nervous when we did that first one, not knowing if folks would even come to the microphone and, and pitch a session. But I planted a few people in the audience. I said, hey, if nobody comes up to the microphone for our ed camp, would you come up and say you'll do a session on this or that or this or that? And much to our surprise and pleasant surprise, we had a line a mile long. We had a three 30-minute uh, uh, mini ed camp sessions that afternoon. And the feedback we got on that day was the best professional learning we had had on a district-wide basis in years, if not ever. So we've got to think outside the box of how we use that time because it is so precious. And as Tom said, how do we recognize and reward and acknowledge and give credit in some way to those teachers who are going above and beyond outside of the school hours on weekends and in the evenings who are learning on their own? How can we honor that? So we had one more question. I was going to preface it a little bit. You know, again, making the analogy to the classroom, it seems like it always fits whenever we're talking about what we do as adult learners or adult leaders or educators with what we want our kids and teachers to be doing together in the classroom. And I don't know how many folks are part of a one-to-one -one district. That too is something we moved to about two years ago, a full one-to-one -one district with Chromebooks at grades three through eight and iPads at grades K through two. But in doing that, we said all along, and we've heard this from other people too, I'm sure, it's not about the device, it's about the pedagogy. Uh, no matter, we could be five to one, and, and we're not going to get there if we don't have the pedagogy right. So I, I enter in our third and final theme of the day with a little trepidation, but at the same time, I know that to get what we need to get, tools are important. So I just want to take, maybe we've only got two or three minutes, Mitch, to have people talk about what tools are using to connect, collaborate, create, um, you know, again, I mentioned already for us, Twitter is kind of that umbrella tool, but what are some other tools out there we could use that could help teachers grow and learn and then possibly help us personalize their learning for them? So Mitch, could we get people to maybe talk for two or three minutes and we'll come back in one final time? Hey folks, um, you know, I'm just looking at the time and I'm worried that we're gonna run out of time. I was talking to Bob Schutz. Mitch, do we have time to bring Bob up? Uh, or should we just go on? I'd like Bob to share for a second what he was saying a little bit about what his district's doing in terms of some tools. Hey, Bob, welcome to the stage. What, what, do you, what can you share with us in a couple of seconds here? Uh, a couple of seconds, our LMS product, Schoology. Uh, has allowed us to create uh, virtualized learning experiences for our adult learners. Uh, and in turn, we're able to personalize their experiences and then have the learners share their evidence of learning through portfolios and a badging system. So it's really helping our teachers identify with experts amongst other members of the staff. So it's really enabling us to, to get to higher places or better, more preferred places with our collaboration. The, uh, that's so important, the uh, badging. I, we, Tom and I wrote about that a little bit, and I know you and I have talked a little bit about this, how uh, it, it may seem funny or you know, contradictory that adults would want to gamify their kids. But again, it seems like this has been a theme of today everywhere I've seen that happen, I've seen it happen very successfully, where teachers are having fun while they're learning and, and earning badges for their learning and doing it for the sake of their learning first and foremost, but also kind of fun gamifying it a little bit. Yeah, and I think it was it was you. I, I've heard it from many people, but I've also heard it from you that the smartest person in the room is the room. So it helps identify the expertise that's already in our rooms so that people know who to go to when they want additional support or want to talk face to face um, to uh, you know enhance their own learning. Hey, thanks for joining in. Mitch, should we uh, drop Bob down and bring up the uh, slides again? And, I, and I, if we were to end on time, I kind of wonder if I should jump to near the end. Why don't you go another one? Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to one more. And Tom, will you pick it up from there? Will you drop me down, uh, Mitch, and bring Tom Murray up? Sure, thanks, Jeff. And I know we want to be respectful of people's time and 
only have just uh, take two more minutes here. And you probably saw on the screen some of the slides that we just had from a number of resources. And as Jeff said uh, very eloquently earlier, we never want to focus on the tools. We want to focus on the why. And so, you know, if you just saw very quickly things like Pinterest and and um, and different tools, Jeff's mentioned Twitter. Uh, some of you are, uh, I'm sure, um, already hopping on Voxer and, and doing some Voxer groups. That is an app that you can use to collaborate with people. But this mantra of a of this graphic says a professional learning network. I personally like to call it a personal learning network, who are you connecting to? Who is ultimately making you a better educator? Because very often we are on Educators Island. We are behind that door by ourselves or we're at district office and we're the only or the principal and we're the only one running the building. Who are you connecting yourself to uh, to make yourself better in that regard so that you can ultimately be better for children tomorrow than you were today? Mitch, next slide quick. Just two, uh, two a, a few, a couple uh, points here. Just, that we want to hit. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, it's when it's the number of hours that staff care about the most, the learning is going to be secondary and we can't set up an environment that the learning is secondary. We, the professional learning has to be about growth, has to be about transformation and not about seat time. Next slide, Mitch. Because when we're measuring seat time, we're ultimately truly measuring the wrong end of the learning. We want to talk about transformation and we want to talk about um, how, how what they're doing has transformed, not just about the seat time. Next slide, Mitch. As we've mentioned here, one size does not fit all for students and one size does not fit all for staff as well. Next slide. We're going to wrap it up. We need to really make sure that anytime, anywhere learning is a must, not just for students, but for staff as well. So how are you making anytime, anywhere learning available for staff? How are you making content available 24 seven? Districts are doing incredible jobs with that. How are you moving your system? So it's not just that it's available from four to six on a Thursday afternoon, that it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there's incredible ways districts are being able to leverage through anytime, anywhere learning. It starts to shift mindset and it starts to shift culture in your buildings and in your district through empowerment so that people can feel a vital part of the process, the learning process, and not just being developed. Go ahead, next slide there. Finally, as we referenced a few times, um, our book on this topic, we got many thoughts on this, on this in here on leading professional learning and tools to connect and empower teachers. The reason we're sharing this here is because of the discount code. If you're interested, um, our publisher Corwin is sharing this discount code with anybody that's registered for it. And you can see if you go to purchase it online through the Corwin site, that will give you a off for today's webinar. I'll give you just a moment if you're interested to jot that down. I believe it's N155A7 for anybody that's interested. Last slide there, if you would. Well, we encourage you to connect. Jeff and I are very available on social media. You can see my Twitter handle at Thomas C. Murray. You can see Jeff's at Jeff underscore Zoll. You can also see our website. I'm Thomas C. Murray and Jeff at jeffzoll.blogspot.com. We encourage you to consider this or continue this conversation uh, from here on out and also after this webinar to be able to connect with us. If you have follow-up questions or thoughts, we would absolutely love to hear from you in that regard. So with that, we just want to say thanks for investing we're sorry we we're two minutes over, but we tried to rush there at the end to be very respectful of your time. But thanks for the conversation. We wanted to model something that was a bit different, not just talking at you for an hour, but letting you connect with some other people, letting you meet some other educators. And uh, thanks for investing the time today. So Mitch, to wrap up, I'll go back over to you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. This has been a really interesting EdChat Interactive. Uh, I don't think we've had, we've ever had as many breakout groups and uh, I'm interested in hearing from those of you who attended um, what uh, to get some feedback. Uh, I learned, certainly learned a lot, but I learned a lot at every one of these EdChat interactives. I hope to see you on Thursday where we're talking about game-based learning. We have a few other sessions coming up. Many of them aren't on our website yet. Uh, we have one coming up, which is how do you use current events and have current events trigger what we do in class? And another on how can you use some of the best-selling uh, children's nonfiction to really get kids engaged in reading nonfiction. Those are those are two of the sessions that we're looking for in the future. Um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Tom. I hope you'll consider coming back and doing a future Ed Chat with us. And um, this is Mitch Weisberg signing off. Everybody have a great rest of the day.